Hello everyone, welcome to the video. My name is Maze, and in this video I'm going to be making this redwood box frame. Every once in a while a project comes along where you get to justify the existence of your shop. Something happens and you have to come to the rescue to show everyone that the space your shop takes up is worth it. Now this was such a project for me. Recently there was a minor earthquake and everyone was okay, but the only casualty was my dad's stained glass sign that he made back in the BC years as he calls them before children when he had the time and money to make stuff. And this was some kit that he bought or so the story goes. And I could remember this sign from my childhood and there were other stained glass things that he made that haven't survived. So it was important to me to save this one if we could. Anyway, the stained glass survived, but the box frame it was in didn't make it. So I swooped in to save the day. Plus it's kind of a collaboration with me and my old man, the Papa Maze, since he made this sign and I'm gonna make the frame. So that's kind of cool. And so with all that out of the way, Let's make some dust. So the first thing I had to do was take it out of the old frame. The glass survived remarkably well. You can see there's a few cracks, but all in all it wasn't bad. Uh, the frame wasn't very good to begin with. You can see it's just butt joints screwed together. It's kind of a miracle it made it this far and that it protected the stained glass so well in the fall but now it's uh, rotted and the corners were loose because of the fall so I took it apart with the plan of rebuilding it with a little bit of maze flare thrown in. Uh, so the wire frame of the stained glass was slightly bent but it went back into place easily enough and I cleaned it up and started measuring it. Making sure to measure it from several different places because you can't count on things being square. But the old man's craftsmanship does the family name proud and it was pretty much dead on. So since this bad boy had survived for so long, I decided it deserved something better than just pine. Not classy. Not classy at all. Day class A. So I bought a redwood 4x4 and cut it into pieces. One will be for the horizontal pieces or the long side and the other is for the vertical pieces or the short side. And the third piece I put to the side and you will see that come back in a later project. So earlier I talked about how my dad's craftsmanship was doing us proud. Well here's me making us look stupid. Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. Now normally dimension lumber is good enough to start milling at the table saw. And I just assumed I could. But about halfway through, it just felt wrong. At first I thought I was cutting too much so I lowered the blade but it still wasn't tracking right. So I checked it and it was kind of like way off square. So I had to go to the jointer. Now this is normally where you want to start if you have some rough lumber. But since I bought dimension lumber I thought it would be closer to square than this was. And you can see how far off it is with that gap between the wood and the table that's how far off of square it is so easy enough to see but you have to look and I didn't so not one of my brightest moments so a little time at the jointer and I was able to square up and flatten two faces And I did that to the long board as well as the short board. And 
and with those I could start the rough milling at the table saw. So the first thing I do is resaw it as close to the middle as possible. And I first have to work around the bad cuts I made earlier on the short piece. But I basically use my two good faces to make as big a cut as possible. And then the third face isn't so great, but I checked it and it was good enough. Uh, but I make a cut only big enough to finish the job. So if it's a little off, it won't be too bad. This is like the rough milling stage. If the third face wasn't good enough, I could have taken it to the planter. Since my table saw won't cut through a whole 4x4, I would have to go to the, to the planter. But I'd have to get the joint, put the joiner away to get the planer out so that I would have to put the planer away to get the joiner out later on and then need to get the joiner away to get the planer out later on and this sort of endless musical chairs of having a small shop. So I just took my chances with the third face not being perfect. Uh, but once I got the pieces resawn, I could take what I thought was the boring side and cut them into square stock. This is going to be the box frame part of the project and so it won't be seen really. And then the other pieces I could clean up that third edge now that it was shorter and then I resaw them and I'm trying to have a nice contrast of sap and heartwood here. I love that contrast and since these pieces will be the decorative picture frame part of the project I wanted it to look appealing and one of the main ways you can tell what's made by a craftsman and what's mass produced is by how the grain is used a mass produced thing there they don't use the grain it just whatever however it comes off the machine it just happens to be that way but as a craftsman I could look at the piece of wood I have and I could use it the best way to give it like a continuity or give it some nice contrasts. I could make design choices based on the on the grain that you don't get in mass produced things. And as a maker, you should begin to take the time and have a plan and do something with what you got and try to make the most out of your wood. So now that everything is rough milled, I can go back through the process and mill everything up straight and true. So the first step in milling is to get one face and one edge straight and square to each other. And so I take them back over to the jointer that was out this whole time and I get that done. Now what I like to do especially if the wood is not super rough, is to take a pencil and mark up the face and the edge that I'm gonna do and just mark it all up so there's a pencil mark on pretty much the whole thing on those sides. And then I send them through the jointer until there's no more pencil mark. And that way I know that every single part of the board is getting touched by the jointer. And then I make a little mark on there. It looks like a little Jesus fish. And that's my mark telling me that this side is good and that I could use this side as a reference from then on. And so I do that with both of my types of stock. I have the square stock and then I have the boards for the face frame and I get two sides, one face and one edge. The square stock is obviously two faces, but they are you know, right next to each other. They share a corner and then I get one face and one edge done on the face frame boards. So then I put the joiner away and I get the planer out and I start getting my faces parallel. Now the square stock, I send it through on both sides since the square board really has four faces instead of two faces and two edges. And it's important that it's square and that they're all the same, but not really that they actually come out to like an inch and a half or anything specific. Doesn't matter what their sides are, how much they measure, as long as they're all the same and everything's square. So I just keep going until all the faces are true 
and then I take one or two more passes on each face and then those are done. Uh, for the face frame boards, I could only do the second face on the planer. So I won those through and for this because I'm just going to use a new special kind of router bit that we're going to see later on these, I did want them to be exactly three quarter inch when I was done so I could see how the router bit worked on normal size stock. It ends up not really being that important, but I didn't know that until later on after I used the router bit. I wanted to start with a known dimension. Uh, then to get the last edge perfect, you go over to the table saw and cut as little off as possible um, to get a fresh edge. I wasn't sure how wide I wanted them, so I made them as wide as possible. But you can see I didn't get all the chipped out edge off the first one the first time, so I took another small pass on all of them so all were perfectly straight and square and all the same size. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you mill up rough lumber. And with these three tools, the trinity of milling I call them, I took a 4x4 and I turned it into whatever I needed. And it was pretty much be impossible to find redwood in the sizes I needed. And if I could, it probably would have cost me at least twice as much. Here I think the 4x4 was like 15 bucks. So a jointer and a planer pay for themselves rather quickly. You could make a joint or a jig to joint on the table saw. So if you could only get one, I would start with the planer as long as you have a table saw. But if you don't have a table saw, you should get that first. But um, you really kind of need like all three of these to really be able to mill up rough lumber. So this next little section is going to be kind of a review for this router bit. It's a picture frame bit I got on Amazon. And overall, I think it's pretty good, um, especially considering it's not that expensive. One thing you do have to keep in mind is that it's Chinese made. So the arbor is in metric and it doesn't fit in American routers. It's just barely too big to fit in a quarter inch coil and way too small for a half inch coil. So you have to buy this adapter so you could put it in a half inch coil. So if you're going to get this bit, you have to get the adapter at the same time if you're in America. So I had milled everything to be as wide as I could get it. Um, from the stock I had and now that I had the bit I could cut the face frame to the proper width. These are just slightly wider than I want so that the bearing has something to ride along and I could cut that off later and now I'm trying to cut it so that the line between the sap and the heartwood is in the middle purely for aesthetics and I'm going to keep these off cuts for my backing which you'll see later. Now in normal life, I tend to be rather conservative, but when it comes to woodworking, I tend to be more gung-ho and just get the job done. The victory! And things like here, I'm cutting a few inches of practice board on this new router bit, and I'm like, okay, I'll do it on the real thing now, even though I spent all this time milling it out to be perfect. I'll rest my good stuff just thinking, oh, I have the bearing, and I'll just hold it straight. So at first, I'm worried about this knot, and it handled it rather well, but the problem is that it's rocking on its edge, so it's not coming out even, and even though I'm smart enough to know that something's wrong, because it's not coming out right. I'm not smart enough to figure it out, so I just keep thinking, oh, I'll straighten it out on the next pass, and I keep taking more passes, and then the edge keeps getting thinner, and then it keeps coming out worse. Ladies and gentlemen, what is absolutely clear is that we are witnessing 
so luckily I had milled everything to be a lot thicker than I ended up needing and now that I had kind of worked with the router bit a little bit I knew that I didn't need it that thick so I could go back to the planer and kind of plane away my mistake and erase that obviously I had to plane all the other pieces down so they'd all be the same thickness and then while I was doing that I thought about what was going wrong with the router bit and so then I decided that it needed a fence so I rigged one up and it seemed to work a lot better and so encouraged by this I keep going It stopped it from rocking too far forward, which was the main problem, but now it didn't stop it from rocking too far back. So then once I figured that out, I could put a guide on the back of it. And it's almost perfect now. You can see with the long pieces that because my, my quote unquote router table is so small that it rocks ever so slightly. And so, what I need is like a feather board along the top as well right in front of the bit to hold it down so to use this bit you basically need a guide on all three sides of the board and I thought I could do it without any but I did find the minimum needs of this bit albeit the hard way and it needs basically every guide you could have it probably needs to be fair a legitimate router table to use uh, so luckily I had this other redwood pieces that were the same thickness that I decided I was going to use for the short sides. So I routed those out as well. And having made all my mistake on the stock that I spent forever milling, I routed out the scrap wood perfectly on the first try. They were, however, a little too wide, so I cut them to the same width as the other ones. And luckily it had the sap and heartwood contrast that I was going for as well, albeit not as good as the, as the real pieces would have been. But it still came out alright. And then I took those offcuts that are for the backing from earlier and I routed out a 45 degree chamfer in them. So now everything's pretty much ready to go. All I have to do is start putting it together and actually building this thing. So the first thing I do is I take all my pieces, every single one of them, and I go over to the miter saw, set it to 45, and I cut a 45 degree miter on every thing, on one side of every single piece. So the first thing I'm going to do is build the box frame and I take the pieces over to the sign and I lay it out and I mark where the sign ends. Then using the combination square I mark that side and then make the 45 degree marker on the face. Then I go to the miter saw and line it up with the saw teeth and I set my stop block and I cut it. And then I could put the other one against the stop block and cut it as well and the long sides are done and then I repeat the process for the short sides and that's the basic process of the rest of my cuts. And then before I glue it up I take the opportunity to sand everything up to 220. Some of these faces won't be easily accessible after this so I always try to sand everything kind of as I go so I have less sanding to do at the end and then I get easy access to a lot of the parts. Then using corner clamps to make sure everything is nice and square, I go ahead and glue and screw the box frame together. Then I cut the face frame to fit the box frame using the same method I used earlier. And I could then glue and brad nail in 
the face frame. And as you can tell, this is after lunch. Now this product placement is pure happenstance. I'm not sponsored by In-N-Out, but if In-N-Out wants to sponsor me, I will find a way to put an In-N-Out cup in every shot. It's like people only do things because they get paid. And that's just really sad. I'm just saying, you know, in and out. Have your people call my people and we'll set something up. And then I hand sanded everything or the face frame to 220. And since this was going to be outside, I thought it would be a good test for the Malou finish, which if you want to know how to make, I have a video on that in the cards. And I love me a nice oil finish. I always feel like I'm Dr. Frankenstein adding lightly to my creation. And I'm like, Alive! It's alive! It's alive! And after I'm done with the face frame, I switch to the shop tiles to apply the oil. Applying it by brush just wasn't really doing it for me. It was taking forever. But I like to savor the moment, so I kind of did it on the face frame part. So I applied about three coats over the next couple of days. And then I used this feed and wax stuff for the first time. It's basically orange oil and beeswax um, to finish up the finish. Now home projects are a good time to try new finishes and for me I like this stuff. I think the Maloof finish with this feed and wax is going to be my go-to for a while. And then I once again cleaned off the sign, this time the front and back of it and just made sure that it was nice and good. So. You wouldn't have to worry about it for a while. And then I took those backing strips I had made earlier and I had put finish on those too as I was finishing the main frame. And I used finishing nails and hammered those into the back to hold the sign in place. And that's it all done. And it pretty much came out exactly like I had wanted it to. Uh, there was the tragedy of the sides that I had to use some scrap to make up for the mistakes on that. But um, I was happy with it. And the idea was that it would go back outside in the patio bar where the old one was. But it was liked so much that it was decided it would be put inside from now on. And so I'll have to test the outside durability of the Maloof finish on something else, but I took it as a compliment. And that's the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it or learned something, I'd appreciate it if you'd click that thumbs up. A craftsman is always pleased to hear his work is appreciated. Or if you know someone who could use or would enjoy this, please share it with them. That way you can build me up so I won't have to brag about myself later. And if you would like to see more content like this, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. I'd be honored if you would join us. And watch a few more of my videos. Please, sir. I want some more. So thanks for watching, and until next time, support your local craftsmen, or get out in your workshops, and make your own dust. And together, we can make making great again.